All right. The rumor is that everybody quit after the second time. Really? What's it? 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 So, uh, all right, so we're going to start with the last part of the semester, which entails mostly uh, partial differential equations and different coordinate systems and also the numerical approximation. Um, I, uh, I collected your exams, uh, some of which were left uh, underneath my door, some of which were sent by email. I printed those, and I'm collecting the originals now. Um, and I started grading them, so I should have everything ready. I don't know if I, by Thursday, I'm going to shoot for Thursday, but I'll see, okay? At the latest, by next use. Um, and I'm going to give priority to that. I found a TA, finally, uh, who's going to help me creating the homework. So the homework uh, is being done in parallel. All right, so um, this will be lecture, what, 18? So, so we pretty much have eight eight lectures left, and uh, from here until the end of the semester, that includes the last lecture on the on Tuesday, the first or the third, no, it's the first of December. Um, and in those eight lectures, we are going to cover most of what we need to know. Uh, about how to analytically solve the uh, uh, partial differential equations that govern certain uh, classes of uh, problems in engineering and sciences, um, including most problems in, in mechanical engineering that deal with uh, either fluid mechanics or heat transfer or solid mechanics, some wave-like problems. Um, and we are going to try to at least establish the, uh, the framework of how do, we, um, how do we approximate those solutions of partial differential equations. Uh, using numerical methods. Uh, we did solve ordinary differential equations and, and, and systems of uh, ordinary differential equations using uh, uh, what are called time integration methods, uh, whether it's Euler or Runge-Kutta or Hoyne's method. These are just time evolution or time integration methods. When we deal with uh, equations that, are, that could be in multi-dimensions, then we need uh, an approach that will allow us to calculate the, uh, the operators, the differential operators in space, the multidimensional differential operators in space as accurately as possible. All right, so before we get to that point, we need to at least establish and classify these partial differential equations. What are they used for? And, and that's going to happen at the end of the class today. But as a preamble, I want to talk about eigenvalue problems because it's going to be necessary to understand why do we need to know how to solve an eigenvalue problem in order to get to the solution of a uh, partial differential equation. An eigenvalue problem is basically an ordinary differential equation. We are going to need to uh, need, need to identify an eigenvalue problem and need to solve it appropriately for the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions in order to tackle, uh, analytically at least, partial differential equations. So let's talk about these eigenvalue problems. So these are these are boundary value problems in one dimension, one dimension, say, whose solutions only Given 
basically a boundary value problem whose solution is zero. But it turns out that in order to make it non-zero out of necessity, because we might need a solution that is not zero, we, we can do so by specifically at certain points or certain characteristic values. So let's phrase that with an example, with an example. So given the following BBP, boundary value problem, where the governing equation is, let's say, the second derivative of y with respect to x squared plus lambda squared yx is equal to 0. And boundary conditions, we have y at 0 equals 0 and y at l equals 0. All right, so the first thing we see when, or the first thing we imagine when we see this, this, this particular problem is that we have a homogeneous GE and we have a homogeneous set of boundary conditions. So a natural solution for this problem is y is equal to zero. Okay, the solution y equal to zero satisfies both the governing equation and the set of boundary conditions. So that's a, an admissible solution. That's a, an okay solution. That works. But for some reason, we might need a solution that is not trivial. So a solution to this boundary value problem is simply y of x equals zero, which is called a trivial solution. So however, we may need a non-trivial solution so somehow we should be seeking an untrivial solution so let's see what is the general solution to this equation remember second order linear ordinary differential equation homogeneous with constant coefficients What is the solution to that equation? With a positive lambda square y? Cosine sine, right? All right. So a cosine of lambda x plus b sine of lambda x. That solution is a general solution to that equation, a general class solution to that equation. When we differentiate it twice, we get the same thing as the negative of lambda square y. Okay? So that satisfies the governing equation. Now let's try to make, let's try to satisfy the boundary conditions to find the particular solution. So the first boundary condition says that y at x equal to zero is equal to zero. That means that a cosine of zero plus b cosine uh, of zero is equal to zero. The cosine of zero is equal to one. The sine of zero is equal to zero. So basically what do we get out of this? That a is equal to zero. That means that we were, what we have left is b <coughs> sine of lambda x. <coughs> that is so far the only general solution. It is semi-general because it satisfies the governing equation. It satisfies one of the boundary conditions. Now we need to satisfy the other one. And that's when it gets tricky. So the other one says that y at L is also equal to zero, which means that B times the sine of lambda L should be equal to zero. So now we have a product, B and the sine of lambda L, it should be equal to zero. So this is this leads to two options. Either B is equal to zero, or the sine of lambda L is equal to zero. Okay, now this doesn't work because this will lead to a trivial solution. If we make b equal zero, then the whole solution is equal to zero, so we're back to square one where an admissible solution, admissible solution is y equals zero, which satisfies everything, yeah, perfect, but it's zero. And we might not want a trivial solution. So our only option 
is that the sine of lambda L is equal to zero. That means that lambda L is equal to the sine minus one of zero, or the arc sine of zero. When is the arc, uh, when is the sine equal to zero? Yeah, at the x-axis, right? Either at zero degrees, or, or zero radians, or pi radians. Zero radians, or pi radians. Okay, so zero, pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, so on and so forth, right? So, basically, that this means that lambda L will be equal to either zero, pi, two pi, three pi, so on and so forth. Which means that lambda L is equal to n pi. So, we can conclude that lambda n is equal to n pi over L. And these are called the eigenvalues. Now, why are these called the eigenvalues? These are the characteristic values, the only values for which that, sol that equation or that boundary value problem has a non-trivial solution. It is only possible for these particular equation there to have non-trivial solutions if lambdas are equal to n pi over L. So we have an infinite number of them. From n equals 0 to n equals infinity, we have an infinite number of eigenvalues. And then therefore, y of x will be equal to b times the sine of lambda nx, because that's what the general solution we found was to be. And this function right here we call psi n of x equals to the sine of lambda n x. These are the eigenfunctions. All right. So the concept is simple. This is a problem that would have a trivial solution. A trivial solution is okay, it's admissible. But we might need one that is non-trivial, and it would only be non-trivial if the lambdas happen to be n pi over L. And then the solution would be this. So if we plot these solutions, we have an infinite number of them. We plot the solution from 0 to L, which is x. One solution is when n is equal to 0, we have the sine of 0. Well, that is a trivial solution. It's part of the family. So that would be lambda 0 of x. The other solution lambda 1 of x. The other solution Two, or I'm sorry, psi 2 of x, and so on and so forth. And psi 3 would be one where we have three <coughs> waves. So we have infinite number of overlapping particular solutions satisfying All right, so that's an eigenvalue problem. That's it, nothing more than that. Now if I give you a problem that looks just like it, I say, well, given the boundary value problem, where the governing equation is the second y, the x squared minus lambda squared y of x is equal to zero with boundary conditions. y of zero is equal to zero and y of l is equal to zero. So we have the same boundary conditions and the problem, the given, the given governing equation is slightly different. We have a minus sign instead of a plus sign. Okay? 
So let's see if we can find they're both homogeneous as before. So it seems that zero is uh, again an acceptable solution. Zero will satisfy both the governing equation and the boundary conditions. Let's see if we can find one that is now zero. What is the general solution to this equation? The one with the minus sign, if we find the auxiliary problem and solve for the roots, the roots of these are plus and minus lambda, they're real. And when the roots are real, we get A cosine hyperbolic of lambda x plus B sine hyperbolic of lambda x. So we get the hyperbolic solution instead of the trigonometric one. Now let's impose under conditions to say y at zero is equal to zero, which is equal to a cosine hyperbolic of zero plus b sine hyperbolic of zero. Cosine hyperbolic of zero is one, sine hyperbolic of zero is zero, and that leads to the same thing, a is equal to zero. So we are at uh, y of x equals b sine hyperbolic of lambda x. Then we have the second boundary condition. Y at L is equal to zero. Then we have B times the sine hyperbolic of lambda L. And then we have the same two choices. Either B is equal to zero or the sine hyperbolic of lambda L is equal to zero. Now the problem here is that the sine hyperbolic is a function that never crosses the x-axis. Okay? It doesn't oscillate like the sine. And it, sine crosses the x-axis an infinite number of times. The sine hyperbolic doesn't, so this is not possible. So this is not possible. It would only be possible if lambda is equal to zero, or if L is equal to zero. Well, L is a distance, so it cannot be equal to zero. If lambda is zero, well, that's the only possible solution for which this can have a non-trivial solution, but then you're talking about a completely different equation that doesn't have that solution. If lambda is equal to zero, we're just talking about this equation. We end up with a polynomial, right? So, in essence, the only choice is that b is equal to zero. So, that leads to y of x equals zero, is being a trivial solution. So this is not, not an eigenvalue problem. Eigenvalue problems are inherently oscillatory. In order to, for them to be able to satisfy the conditions and finding characteristic values for which solution is non-zero, they have to oscillate it around the x-axis. Otherwise, they're not an eigenvalue problem. Okay, so there's an important concept of that. Just to change the sign will make an eigenvalue problem or not. And we will use that concept when solving partial differential equations. Okay, you'll see that. that actually determinant into choosing a particular sign in order to construct an eigenvalue problem in a particular direction and a not eigenvalue problem in another direction. Okay. Now one important characteristic or property of eigenvalue problems is that they satisfy orthogonality conditions. And we've already discussed this concept of orthogonality. And you will see also why orthogonality is powerful when we solve partial differential equations. So far, we've been doing it in the abstract. We say, well, a function is orthogonal to itself if the integral of that function over a range is equal to zero, uh, except when whatever index happens to match. Okay? We, we, we had a question like that on the homework, on the, on the exam, and we discussed this orthogonality property. So, so far, we haven't used it for anything, but it's going to become very obvious why it is an important property. One important property 
So eigenfunctions is that they obey orthogonality. That is the integral from A to B of psi n of x, psi m of x times some weight function is equal to either 0 if n is different than m and is equal to some value f if n is equal to m. That's what orthogonality means. That means that the integral of all these functions, if we take, for example, we'll go a couple pages back, and we take two of these possible eigenfunctions. Okay, there's infinite of them with multiple frequencies, right? And we just pick two. Let's pick, let's pick the one and the two. Let's pick the one with one oscillation and the other one with two oscillations. And we integrate it, we'll get zero. One cancels the other. Okay? See? They have interference. But if we just integrate one times itself, then we'll get something that is not zero. Okay, that's the, pro the concept of orthogonality, and you will see why that concept is important. <coughs> so, where A B is the range of the eigenfunction, and Wx is a weight. This is, then it's said that xi n of x is orthogonal on A to B with respect to Wx, that weight function. All right. Let's go straight to an example. So we already determined that yn of x is equal to the sine of lambda nx such that lambda n is equal to n pi over L and x going from 0 to L is an eigenfunction. Okay? Now show that is orthogonal on 0 to L with respect to Wx equal 1. The weighting function is 1. All right. So let's try it when n is equal to m first, okay? So what we're going to try to do is show that i n m, which is equal to the integral from 0 to L, um, is dx. And this is equal to 1 in this case. All right, so i and m is equal to the integral from 0 to L of the sine of n pi <coughs> Lx times the sine of m pi Lx dx. All right, how do we solve that integral? We do by parts, and then if we do by parts, we end up we're gonna end up with an integral of the cosine times the cosine. And then what do we do? That's as, as difficult as it. So we integrate by parts again, and we end up with an integral of the sine times the sine, which equates to the original integral, and then we can explicitly solve for it. Okay? So integrating 
I parts twice leads to I and M is equal to zero. Okay, I'm not going to go through the mechanics <coughs> of these. It's pretty straightforward. Integrate by parts twice, are you going to end up with the same integral times the coefficient n pi l squared plus n pi l squared, multiplying the whole thing. All right. Now, if you were to use the same coefficient, so if n is equal to m, then i n n is equal to the integral from 0 to l of the sine square of n pi over l x dx. Now let's use this identity that the sine square of theta is equal to 1 half minus 1 half of the cosine of 2 theta. So i and n is equal to the integral from 0 to l of 1 half minus 1 half of the cosine of twice n pi over l x dx. All right? And this one we can integrate. Just integrating 1 half. What is the integral of 1 half? x over 2, and that needs to be evaluated between 0 and L. And the integral of the cosine is the sine, right? So this will be minus 1 half times the sine, I'm going to write it up here, of 2n pi L x divided by 2n pi over L. And this needs to be evaluated between 0 and L. So I N N is equal to X over 2 evaluated between 0 and L. We get L over 2, right? And this one we get minus 1 half. Um, let's bring the uh, coefficient here. 1 over 2 N pi over L times the sine of when L is equal, when X is equal to L, we get 2N pi minus the sine of 0. What is the sine of 0? 0. And what is the sine of 2N pi? When N is equal to 0, we get the sine, the sine of 0. When N is equal to 1, we get the sine of 2 pi, which is 0. And we get the sine of 4 pi, which is 0, the sine of so on and so forth. So this is always, always 0. Just going around the circle to the positive x-axis. And therefore, I n n is equal to L over 2. And there you go. So, I n m, which is the integral from 0 to L of the sine of n pi over L x times the sine of m pi over L x dx, is equal to either 0 if n is not equal to m or l over 2 if n is equal to m. So it is orthogonal for any value of n and any value of l. Therefore, the function psi n of x equals to the sine of lambda n x such that lambda n is equal to n pi over L is orthogonal on 0 to L with respect to a weight function of 1. All right. Now, sines and cosines are not the only eigenfunctions. Okay, for some, sometimes we'll end up with cosines, sometimes we end up with sines. Depend on the boundary condition combination that we use. The boundary conditions that we use 
was y at 0 equals 0, y at L equals 0. Those are first kind boundary conditions on both ends. They have to be homogeneous. The whole problem needs to be homogeneous to be an eigenvalue problem. If we change one of the boundary conditions, let's say we make y prime at 0 equals 0, or we, we make y prime at L equals 0, we might end up with a cosine or a combination of sine and cosine. Okay? But it doesn't, it will not escape that. And the eigenvalues might end up being slightly different. But sines and cosines are not the only eigenfunctions. There are functions that satisfy everything about eigenvalue problems. They, they have characteristic values. They oscillate around the x-axis, and they are orthogonal to each other with respect to a weight factor on a range. Okay? Now, all these all these eigenvalue problems can actually be encapsulated into a single <coughs> equation, into a single problem. So all eigenvalue problems can be generalized. into a class called the Sturm Liouville problems. Okay, so this is a class of problems where the governing equation looks like this, d dx d of x, d psi, dx, plus <coughs> q of x, plus omega lambda square, or w lambda square, psi of x, is equal to 0. If we have a governing equation that somehow we can express like that, and find p, q, and w, with boundary conditions that look like A1 times D P D X at X equal A plus A2 times P at A is equal to zero. So that's a homogeneous boundary condition, which can be a combination of either first kind, second kind, or third kind boundary condition. Okay, but it's still homogeneous. And d1, p dx, y equal, sorry, x equal b, plus b2, psi of b, is equal to 0. So notice that this is homogeneous. Governing equation and boundary condition. It's just that the boundary conditions are of different classes. They can be... They both can be, if A1 and B1 are A0, we end, up with, we end up with the same type of boundary conditions as before. First kind boundary condition. Okay? Where we impose, at both ends of the spectrum, we impose the value of the field variable. In this case, I. So, if we can express a boundary value problem this way, and identify the function P, identify the function Q, identify the function W, these... EVP has solutions in terms of eigenfunctions. Sin of x with eigenvalues lambda n's and the eigenfunctions. are orthogonal <coughs> on the range A to B with respect to this function WX on the BBP. So, the 
Let's look at an example here. Let's look at an example, and let's say I give you again this equation with boundary conditions. Now we have dy dx at x equals 0 is equal to 0, and y <coughs> at l is equal to 0. So we have a second kind boundary condition on the left side and a first kind boundary condition on the right side. We're enforcing the slope on the left, enforcing the value on the right. But both are homogeneous, they're equal to zero. So if we compare to the storm Liouville, comparing Stern you build problem. What do we have? We have P of X is equal to if we compare this one to this one, P of X is equal to <coughs> one. Q of X is equal to hmm? zero. And W of X is equal to 1. Right? That'll make this equation fit into this problem. All right? And then the boundary conditions A1 is equal to 1, A2 is equal to 0, B1 is equal to 0, B2 equal to 1. So this is called natural or Neumann or second kind BC under condition. This is called forced Dirichlet or first kind. Three names for the same thing. When we impose a value, we call it a force boundary condition, a there is left boundary condition, or a first kind boundary condition. When we impose a slope, we call it a natural, a Neumann, or the second kind boundary condition. And imposing a combination of the two, if A1 and A2 would have values different than zero, combination of the slope and the value, then we call that a third kind boundary condition, or convective, or Robin. Name Robin, convective, third kind. All right. So let's see. What is the general solution to this equation? The general solution to this equation, again, we already did it. It's A cosine of lambda x plus B sine of lambda x. Now we need to impose the boundary conditions. We need to impose boundary conditions, and uh, that would be dy dx at x equals zero is equal to zero. That's one of the boundary conditions. So, who is dy dx? That would be minus lambda a sine of lambda x plus lambda b cosine of lambda x. And this needs to be evaluated at x equals 0, and this needs to be evaluated at x equals 0. So we have 0 is equal to minus lambda a the sine of 0 is 0, plus lambda b, the cosine of 0 is 1. And from here, now we have that b is equal to 0. So 
So the eigenfunction so far is equal to a cosine of lambda x. So instead of being the sine, it's the same problem as before. We just changed one of the boundary conditions. And now the eigenfunction is a cosine instead of the sine. The other boundary condition says that y at, e at L, y at L is equal to zero, which is equal to A cosine of lambda L. This needs to be zero. And the only way, again, the choices for this to be zero is that either A is equal to zero or the cosine of lambda L is equal to zero. So obviously we are not going to elect that A is equal to zero because that will make the whole thing trivial. We are going to elect that the cosine of lambda L be zero. So if the cosine of lambda L be e is equal to zero, then lambda L is equal to the arc cosine of zero. And uh, the arc cosine, the cosine is zero at 90 degrees and at 270, 90, 270. So every pi starting at pi, pi over two. So it would be, um, it would be equal to uh, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, etc. So lambda n is equal to pi times 2n plus 1 divided by well, so it's pi over 2 times 2n plus 1, that's pi over L, pi over 2 divided times 2n plus 1. And the eigenfunction is equal to the cosine of lambda n x. So we started with the same problem, slightly different boundary conditions, and we ended up with different eigenfunctions, cosines and of sine, and different eigenvalues. All right, we can also show orthogonality. We can also show that the integral of the cosine square gives you a number, well the integral of the cosine of these x with an n different than an m gives you zero, okay? All right, let's look at another example. And let's look at the Bessel equation of order nu. In the Bessel equation of order nu was x squared, the second y dx squared, plus x dy dx, plus m squared x squared minus nu squared, y of x is equal to zero. So that doesn't look at all like this, like a storm little wheel problem. But we can try to make it look like, like one. Okay, first thing we do is divide the whole thing by x. x, the second y dx squared plus dy dx plus m squared x minus nu squared over x, y of x is equal to zero. And now we can group these two terms right here into d dx of 
x dy dx. Now we'll make up these two. Plus m squared x minus nu squared over x y of x is equal to 0. That's the same equation. Now we compare these to a storm Liouville problem and try to identify from here what is Px, what is Qx, and what is Wx. And we get px is obviously e equal to x. That's this px here comparing to the x in the brackets. qx looks like minus lambda squared over x. And <coughs> wx is equal to x. That's a weight function such that the eigenvalues are these values m squared. Which is what multiplies the weight function. Weight function x being multiplied times m squared. All right. So the eigenfunctions equal to either the Bessel functions of the first kind of order nu of mx or the Bessel function of the second kind of order nu of mx depending on the combination of boundary conditions depending on combination of conditions with lambda m's being equal to the roots the nth root of the Bessel function of order nu and this is m root of Bessel function of order no and through orthogonality we find that from a to b psi n of x times i m of x times x that's a weight function the x is equal to either zero if n is equal to m different than m or some value f if n is equal to one. All right, so we can make up a whole bunch of problems out of the stern Liouville class, and we end up with Legendre polynomials, Legendre functions. The Legendre equation is also part of the, uh, of the stern Liouville problem. The Hermite equation is also part of the stern Liouville problem. The sine and cosine equations, the Bessel equations, and they, we all end up we end up with oscillating functions as a solution where eigenfunctions who are orthogonal to each other with respect to a weight function that is part of the equation itself. All right. Now, why is this all relevant to partial differential equations? Let's see. Partial differential equations are PDEs. Okay, now 
in reality, all problems are partial differential equations. Okay, the, the part that we can like, that we can simplify them to be an or, ordinary differential equation usually comes from idealization of the condition. Okay, the field variable, whatever it is, the temperature only changes in one direction. But we know that physically, all problems are 3D, and not only that, all problems are 3D and time, and time is also a dimension. So we just eliminate some of that because we say it's not relevant, it's not important, we're only interested in what happens in one direction, and we can integrate what happens in the other direction, or it's because it's a constant, or because basically it just doesn't change. Okay? So these are differential equations. Whose solution depends on at least two dimensions or at least one dimension and time. Therefore, you're going to see partial derivatives on the equation. The dependent variable or the solution to ordinary differential equations is, is a function of one variable and therefore the only derivatives you'll see are ordinary or total derivatives. In this case you'll see partial derivatives. Now depending on the problem, boundary conditions, Initial conditions, etc. Different techniques may be used to solve PDEs. One is called separation of variables. Very simple technique, but it depends on many things. Its, it's applicability it depends on many things. Okay? So it's very limited uh, on its application. The other one is called superposition and SOV. So they're used together, the method of superposition and SOV. When something doesn't fit, into the class that we can solve by separation of variables, then we use superposition and then apply separation of variables. <coughs> Variation of parameters, BOP. Sometimes we can use a combination of Laplace transforms. Laplace transforms. Um, in combination with separation of variables too. Just leave it at Laplace transforms. Fourier transforms. Complex solutions for sustained periodic problems. Hamel's theorem for time dependent boundary conditions and Green's function. Green's function. So these are the basically the eight eight analytical methods that can be used to try or attempt to get the solution of a partial differential equation. And all of these will essentially depend on, on um, the type of problem. It depends on the combination of under conditions and the initial condition. And the problem needs to be simple, which means that analytically we can only solve simple problems if they're partial. Okay? They have to be linear. They have to be most, 
more than likely constant core fissures. Sometimes some variable core fissures, depending on the coordinate frame. They have to be framed within separable coordinates, meaning that if we're solving things in the Cartesian coordinate system, it has to be a rectangle. Okay? It cannot be something with a, that has multiple edges. If we want to solve it analytically, it cannot be a triangle, not even a triangle. Well, with the Green's function method, we can solve problems in the triangle analytically. But that's about it. You cannot get to a complicated domain. In 3D, you can only solve in parallel pipes, cubes. If you're talking about cylindrical coordinate system, you can only do pipes or hollow pipes. If you're talking about spheres, you can only do sections of a sphere, hollow spheres, or sections of a hollow sphere. So thereby that uh, old saying that mathematicians only know how to shave round sheep. Okay? Because you can only solve very, very simple problems. Okay? What do we do on real problems? If we want to solve, I don't know, the same equations that we're attempting to solve of heat transfer over an airfoil. Well, we need numerical methods. This is when they, these, these methods cease to apply, they cease to give you a solution, right? But they provide you with the fundamentals of what is an admissible solution, when a solution can be applicable. And if you want to come up with a numerical method to solve something, you better have something to compare with. So you start with a simple problem, you, you come up with a numerical method, an algorithm, uh, you try to solve a benchmark problem on a simple geometry for which you have an analytical solution, then you can compare the two and then say, okay, my numerical method works. And if I increase the resolution of the grid, I get better, uh, I get a better approximation of the, of, the, uh, of the analytical solution. If you don't have anything to compare it with, then your numerical technique, uh, you don't even know whether it works or not. All right? So, we're gonna talk about some of these techniques here. And the first technique that we are going to cover is this one of separation of variables. So separation of variables. This one is due to D'Alembert, Bernoulli, and Euler. All three of them used it independently. Actually, they didn't get together to work on that. They used it independently. And uh, so it's attributed to the trio. Okay, D'Alembert working on fluid mechanics, Bernoulli, which is actually also working on fluid mechanics, and Euler is the same Euler that you find everywhere. Same <laughs> mathematician. And, and they were not even of the same nationality, so they didn't know each other, or at the same time. All right. So requirements, by the way, Euler was blind. So he did all these while well, not being able to see. Which one died in the duel? Huh? Which one died in the duel? Uh, Galois. That's a French kid. He was 19. All right. So the requirements of the applicability of, of separation of variables is a simple technique, but as you'll see, we'll need this concept of eigenvalue problems, um, and we need the, problem, the concept of orthogonality to make it work. That's why we spent so much time explaining. So the problem needs to be linear. That means that both uh, governing equation and boundary conditions need to be linear. Um, linear problem. So, geometry must be framed in an orthogonal separable coordinate system. What, what does that mean? That if we are talking in 2D Cartesian, it needs to be a square or rectangle. Okay? Cannot even be a hollow square or hollow rectangle. That's how, how limited it is. If we're talking about polar coordinates, it has to be a circle or a section of a circle or a hollow circle. If we're talking about spherical, it needs to be a sphere, so on. So the coordinate, the geometry has to be framed within the orthogonal. The limiters of the coordinate system in which is 
actually framed. And most importantly, the last requirement is that, and I'm going to put a star here, is that no more than one non homogeneity in BC, IC, or actually an governing equation. There can only be one. No more than one. Actually, there, there can only be one. There cannot be zero non-homogeneities. What happens if you have zero non-homogeneities? The solution is trivial. There's no getting away from the getting around that. If you have a partial differential equation that is homogeneous, okay, and you have boundary conditions that are homogeneous, nothing drives the problem. The problem, the solution is zero. Okay, solution is trivial. So for these methods to apply. You can only have one non-homogeneity, either one of the boundary conditions or the governing equation or the initial conditions is the only thing that's allowed to be non-homogeneous. So in solving, we A form an eigenvalue problem in the homogeneous direction. Okay, so we're going to have to break this partial differential equation into multiple ordinary differential equations. But the way we construct them is by making sure that in the direction where we have homogeneous conditions, we construct an eigenvalue problem. And then B, use orthogonality of the resulting eigenfunctions to find the constants of integrate, constants of integrate. Okay. So that's all there is to it. So I am going to give you the basics over the next 10 minutes or so on an example. So example, steady heat conduction in Constant conductivity, conductivity medium. medium without heat generation. Okay, so the equation of steady heat conduction would be this. Well, let me give you the equation of heat diffusion. The divergency of K times the gradient of the temperature is equal or plus the heat generation is equal to the density, the heat capacity, or specific heat capacity, the partial of T with respect to T. That's the equation of heat diffusion. Okay? Since we're told that the conductivity is constant, we can take this out, right? Constant K. We are told that there is no conductivity, no generation, zero, so no generation. That would be if internally the medium will have some sort of internal energy generation. That's just energy per unit time per unit volume, so watts per meter cube. And we're told that we're interested in steady state, steady problem. <laughs> Okay, so we have reached already an equilibrium, an asymptotic solution. So the resulting equation is the Laplace of T is equal to zero. We're going to solve that equation. That's our governing equation. And we're going to do so.
in the Cartesian coordinate system on a rectangle that goes from 0 to L and 0 to small l and the y direction. So on this edge we have t is equal to 0. On this edge we have t is equal to 0. Those are the boundary conditions. On this edge we have t is equal to 0. And on this edge right here we have t is equal to some function of y. So those are the four boundaries of this problem. And all boundaries of the problem need to be covered by a boundary condition. There cannot be, for a well-posed problem, there cannot be any portion of the boundary not covered by a known boundary condition. Whether it is first kind, all boundary conditions in this case are first kind because we're imposing temperature, we're enforcing the value, or second kind where we impose the slope of the temperature, that means the heat flux, or third kind where we have a convective condition and we'll, we'll, look, we'll actually go through that. All right, so the boundary conditions are going to be what? T at x equal 0, and any value of y, that's the left edge, is equal to 0. T at x equal L, and any value of y is equal to some given function Fy. It's given, whatever that is. <coughs> T at x comma 0, that's on the bottom edge, is equal to 0, and T at x comma small l, that's on the top edge, is equal to zero. All right, so now we have governing equation and boundary condition. Notice that the boundary, that the governing equation is homogeneous. Governing equation is homogeneous. And that's pretty much because there's no generation. If there was any generation, then the governing equation would be non-homogeneous. And there is only one non-homogeneous PC. This one. Second one there. Therefore, SOV applies. Okay. So, let's start with the governing equation. The Laplace of t of x and y is equal to zero. Now we use the dependency. t depends on x and y. All right? That means that what is the Laplace operator? It's the second derivative of t with respect to x squared plus the second derivative of t with respect to y squared to zero. That's what the Laplace means. And it would be the second with respect to z, should there be a z-axis, but there's not. We're told that the z-axis, everything has been integrated or constant, or it really doesn't matter. We're looking at a plane or we're looking at a cross-section. Things don't happen in the z-axis. All right. Now, let's look at the guts of the separation of variables. We're going to let t of x and y be equal to function x of x and a function y of y. And somehow we're going to make that happen. We're going to make that work. So we arbitrarily say that we're going to break up the temperature into two functions, one that depends on x and one that depends on, sorry, y. Okay? So, what is the partial of t with respect to x? It would be the partial with respect to x of x of x, y of y, which will be, well, because the function of y only depends on y, we can take it as a constant when we differentiate with respect to x, so that would be y of y times the partial of x with respect to x, but because the function x is only a function of x, the partial derivative becomes a total derivative, so this will be y of y dx of x. And another way of essentially describing 
a total derivative will be just saying x prime. Similarly, dt dy would be d dy of x of x, y of y. We can do the same thing, x of x, d dy of y, dy, which is equal to x of x, dy, y, dy, which is equal to x of x, y prime of y. Similarly, the second derivative of t with respect to x squared will be equal to x double prime of x, y of y, and the second derivative of t with respect to y squared will be x of x, y double prime of y. Therefore, the governing equation governing equation translates into x double prime of x, y of y, plus x of x, y double prime of y, is equal to zero. Now we can divide the whole thing by x and y. So we can say that this is x double prime of x divided by x of x plus y double prime of y divided by y of y is equal to zero. Right? You haven't done anything wrong. Everything is based on an assumption. We arbitrarily say that the function t of x and y was going to be x, x, y, y. Plugging that into the governing equation leads to this. It's been separated, and now we can pull each one to one side, to each side of the equality. So on one side of the equality we have x double prime of x over x of x, and on the other side of the equality we have minus y double prime of y is equal to y. This is the new governing equation. New governing equation. Right? And we're going to leave it at that. In the next class, we're going to see how we go about solving each size, each side of that new governing equation, which happens to be ordinary differential equations, right? Because there are only functions of x and functions of y. All right. Any questions? I'll see you Thursday.